Okay. Um, we're talking about alkyl halides and uh, how to prepare them and how to think about the reactions that go into preparing them. Um, and so I want to continue this discussion today uh, talking about alkyl halides. So recall we were talking about how we can take an alcohol, a molecule with alcohol functional group reacted with a hydrogen halide, and we can convert the OH group on that carbon to a carbon halogen bond. Um, there are a lot of aspects of this reaction uh, which are very subtle aspects but lead to differences in um, reaction rates and uh, reaction types. And, and in order to be able to predict reactions and how they proceed, we have to have some idea about the factors that influence those um, various aspects. So for example, the substitution on the carbon matters a lot for how easily the reaction proceeds. Primary carbons require the highest amount of energy. Uh, if the alcohol is attached on a secondary carbon, um, it's a little bit easier. And if it's attached on a tertiary carbon, uh, it's the easiest. And, and proceeds at room temperature in a lot of cases. So for example, methyl cyclohexanol reacts with HBr at room temperature. And we can do this substitution reaction without too much effort. Okay. So if you recall from last time, uh, we discuss the details of how reactions proceed by looking at the step-by-step -step processes involved, and we refer to that as a reaction mechanism. <clears throat> so uh, generally what we do, especially if we, if we encounter a new reaction, um, we propose what those steps might be based on what we know about chemistry, and then we try to do experiments and to show that those steps are what, in fact, takes place. We can try to identify if there are intermediates in the reaction, um, and data has to uh, be aligned with what we're proposing for the individual steps. Um, reactions can be one step, or they can be many steps. Um, and in order to think about reactions, uh, recall we were talking about two aspects of this um, when we think about discussing reaction mechanisms. One is dealing with the overall energy changes in a reaction. So you have starting materials, one or more reactants, and then you have products, and there are changes in bonds, right? Any chemical reaction is just a change in bonds. We've broken some bonds and we've formed some new bonds. And uh, that requires energy to break bonds, and when bonds are formed, it releases energy. And so the overall balance of that is what we refer to as the thermodynamics of the reaction, the change in the reaction from one side to the other. Uh, recall that um, the, that overall reaction change, or the um, Gibbs free energy, okay, um, is made up of several terms. One of the most important ones is the enthalpy or the energies of the bonds. That's so that's the major factor in most reactions. Um, and also there are some entropy terms or measures of disorder. That's important for reactions that may be split apart and form more molecules than you started or combine and form less. <clears throat> um, that's the thermodynamics, the energy change in the reaction. But that doesn't say anything at all about how the reactions proceed and what's, what pathway it takes. That's what we refer to as the kinetic, oops, that's a typo, sorry. Kinetics, there's an extra T in there. Uh, the kinetics of the reaction is referring to reaction rates. How fast the reaction takes place has a lot to do with the, how much energy you have to put into the reaction for it to proceed, right? These energy barriers. So that depends on the pathway that the molecule takes to get to the product. Um, and the number of steps and all of those things. So when we look at the individual steps of a reaction, we can think about the energetics of those individual steps and get some idea about how that affects the overall rate of the reaction. Okay? Uh, so we describe this by uh, showing, for example, in this generic uh, reaction mechanism, an energy profile as the reaction proceeds from reactants here A on the left to the products C on the right. Okay? Uh, this happens to be an example of a reaction which is two steps. So in this case, um, 
There are two, two elementary steps involved. A is being converted into B. Okay. A is being converted into B. And the pathway by which it gets there is over this energy barrier. All right. That energy barrier um, has a, a difference in energy. There's, a, there's a, a highest energy point on that, which is what we refer to as the transition state. Um, and that difference in energy is how much energy minimum you have to put in to get from A to B. Okay. Um, that energy barrier is what we refer to as the activation energy. Activation energy. Because the activation of the reaction required, that's the energy required to get up over that hill. Um, in this case, there is um, there are two steps in the reaction that I've shown here. Okay, so once you form B, then it can go and form, form C. But there's also an energy barrier from B to C. Now, let me clean this up a little bit. So if you think about the energy from B, if you've already achieved the state B, it takes a lot less energy to get from B to C than it does to get from A to B. Right? So which of those steps do you think is going to be faster? The second step. This is going to be a lot faster than this one, right? And even if you look at the overall energy, just from the very beginning up to B, this is smaller than that is. Okay? So the highest energy barrier, um, the higher in energy you have to go to get from one side to the other, the slower the reaction is. Um, and so the reaction, the overall process to go from A on the left all the way to the products C on the right can only be as fast as your slowest step, right? If, if the second step is much faster than the first step, it, it doesn't really matter. This is what's limiting the reaction, okay? If the first step is very fast and the second step is slow, it doesn't really matter what's happening you know, the first step is irrelevant in the overall rate of the reaction. It's what's taking place in the second step. And that's why it's useful to really break apart reaction processes looking at the individual steps involved. Um, this, another term uh, to remind you of, the highest energy barrier in an overall reaction mechanism. In this case, it's this first step. This is what we then refer to as the rate determining step, rate determining, because it's the slowest, and it's the one that dictates the overall rate of the reaction. Again, uh, the point that's important is that for the reaction to proceed, uh, what's going to be important are the reactants that are involved in the, in the highest energy step or the rate determining step. Okay. Uh, well, we're talking about this reaction process, right? We talked about last time that the conversion of um, an alcohol to an alkyl halide takes place by these three steps. The first step uh, involves reaction of the halogen halide with the um, alcohol in an acid-base reaction. And we saw that that was a fast step and a, and a, a reaction which is an equilibrium. Okay. Once you form this protonated alcohol, this oxonium intermediate, <clears throat> then and only then have we suitably activated the carbon oxygen bond to break. So in the second step, what happens is simply the um, carbon oxygen bond breaks to form two species. One is one of the products of the reaction, water, and the other is a carbocation. Carbocation, positively charged carbons. Okay, so this is is an intermediate, also an intermediate in the reaction. Um, and based on what you know about chemistry, comparing to a, a starting material versus a product, this is going to be something that is electron deficient and still reactive. So you, you can imagine it's going to be higher in energy. This second step is a slow step. 
Um, and then the last step, another fast step, is the reaction of the halide ion, which is generated here in the first reaction process now, uh, forming a bond with the carbon that has the positive charge, that's, that has an empty orbital. Okay, and that leads you to then the product. And the important organic product that we're interested in, the new carbon bromine bond. Okay? So, thinking about these three uh, steps in the overall process, going from the starting material, your alcohol, to product bromide. The energetics of these, we can look at all on one reaction energy profile and, and look at that visually. So if you take a look at this, this is the overall potential energy diagram for the reaction. Uh, what's listed here on the left is the potential energy, and the x coordinate is what we refer to as the reaction coordinate. That is, actually that's a very complicated axis. It's basically describing, when you go from this direction to this direction, it's describing how the structure changes from starting material to products. Made up of many, many complex things, which they just generically call the reaction coordinate. Um, but you can see indicated on this several areas where we have transition states, where we have intermediates, and there's a difference, um, and we have products. So in this, in this first step, which is listed here on the left side, right, we start with our alcohol and our hydrogen chloride in this case and we protonate that, and we form the protonated species plus chloride ion. Um, actually, that's a little bit, if you just look at the, the thermodynamics of that step, looking at the bond enthalpies from bonds forming and bonds breaking, we formed an OH bond here, and we broke in an HCl bond, and it's actually lower in energy. But you notice that the activation energy for that step is quite small, right? So this is a very fast equilibrium. Um, overall, this is the highest energy step in the, in the reaction process, the second step. So if the reaction is proceeding, there's at least a minimum of that much energy involved in the reaction, or imposed on that, those reactants, right? So we, this is going to allow, then, these species to go back and forth quite rapidly. That equilibrium from alcohol to protonated alcohol, I like to scribble all over my slides here. Um, that's happening very fast. So, when you're thinking about the overall process, yes, in order to get there, you have to get to some of this protonated alcohol form right here, uh, but you're, you're always forming that. Okay, there's, there's plenty present. As a matter of fact, um, that, that's happening so fast, you don't even have to worry about how quickly this is being formed to go further. This is the slow step, the second step. Okay? The rate determining step. RDS. The rate determining step is that second step. Because that reaches the highest point on this overall reaction profile. Okay. Um, once you get to there, you can go to this intermediate. This is the intermediate carbon with the plus charge, the carbocation. And we also have then generated H2O. And the chloride ion we generated in the first step is still hanging out for the ride. But it's not, it's not necessarily involved in going from here to here, right? The chloride ion itself is just carried along. It's not interacting in any way with what's changing in that reaction. Okay? Um, once you get there, then you can form the new bond to chlorine in this third step. Clean this up a bit. The activation energy for that step from there is very small. So once you climb up to this hill at the top, it's just going to go all the way down <laughs> quite rapidly. Okay, so again, this is the slowest step, the one that determines the rate, the activation energy for that is, is quite high. Um, 
A couple of other things I want to point out on this diagram before we talk a little bit more about the, this, this particular carbocation intermediate. Uh, notice that at the heights of these hills, they, there's a structure drawn which sort of best represents the intermediate structure that doesn't only exist for an instant in time. Okay? Uh, it's at the highest energy point, so it'll immediately go one side or the other once you reach that hill. Um, so you can't isolate it, you can't observe it, uh, because it just doesn't have a finite, any finite lifetime. What does exist are these intermediates. So here's an intermediate, the protonated in alcohol form. The carbocation is an intermediate, intermediate meaning not the final product. And it lies at the bottom of a well in, these, in this overall transformation, at these local minimum here. Okay. Overall, this reaction is exothermic because we start from here and we end up lowering energy in the product. Okay, this, um, this reaction mechanism is one we refer to as an SN1 reaction. SN1 stands for, um, and the S stands for substitution. It's a substitution reaction. The subscript N stands for nucleophilic. That is because there's, uh, what's happening is a chloride nucleophile is replacing the OH leading group. And it's a unimolecular reaction. That's, that's what the one means. Meaning, in the slowest rate determining step, there's only one molecule involved. Okay, and that is this protonated intermediate breaking a bond and forming the carbocation. No other reagent or molecule is involved in, in that step process, right? We're going to come back to that and talk a little bit more about uh, SN1 and what that means for the, for the rate. But first I want to talk about this intermediate, okay? Really, in order to understand why some alcohols react faster than the others, we have to have an understanding of the formation of that intermediate. Because it is this carbocation which is generated in the process of that slowest step. Okay? So the energy of this is going to matter a lot to how high of a hill you have to climb. And that's going to matter on how fast the reaction proceeds. Okay, so if we look at this, the one on the example from the reaction coordinate diagram in the previous slide was a tert butyl carbocation. Remember, if it's a tertiary alcohol, it reacts at room temperature with something like HCl or HBr. So it, it happens relatively fast compared to other kinds of alcohols. So this tertiary substituted carbon of this intermediate must have some influence. So a little bit about a carbocation. It is, it is um, a carbon which has three bonds, three signal bonds to it, and one empty orbital. That's because electrons have left. When we, have, when we broke off the water from this, the H2O that comes off, the oxygen took the electrons with it. Both of them that were in the bond to the carbon. And so that leaves carbon empty of electrons in one of the orbitals and with a plus charge, a formal plus one charge. Okay. And since it's an empty orbital, it doesn't have it doesn't have electron-electron repulsion with the other bonds in the molecule. So its geometry is going to be planar. Okay? And it's sp2 hybridized. So the empty orbital, remember we talked about this when we talked about hybridization, the empty orbital will be in a, a unhybridized p orbital, and so the other three bonds that are left are made up of sigma bonds from sp2 hybrids, not sp3 hybrids. So it's a flat molecule. Here's a little bit better picture of that. It's a flat molecule, uh, meaning all of those methyl groups are in one plane. This is a better, probably, picture of what the um, p orbital uh, space looks like, the empty space. That is empty, that's positive charge, where you see that space. 
Um, and that's the empty orbital that the chloride, when the nucleophile, the chloride comes in to form the new bond, the electrons are going into that orbital, and then it rehybridizes into an sp3 carbon. So if I can just back up a slide here for a second uh, and show you those intermediates again. Uh, the carbon at the beginning, oops, where's my drawing tool? The carbon at the beginning and the carbon that the alcohol is attached to in this intermediate still has four bonds to it. So those are sp3 hybridized carbons. They're tetrahedral. Once you break this bond, and this is showing the bond breaking halfway through, you get to a carbocation, which is now sp2 hybridized. And then when you form that new bond, there's the transition state with the chlorines, electrons forming a new bond. Then that electron density is taking up space. It goes to the product, and now we have an sp3 hybridized carbon back at the end. Okay? So what we talked about before for hybridization and structure is very important when we talk about the, the changes as this is taking place in this reaction. Okay, well, one of the things that we observe is that depending on the substitution of the carbon, a carbon cation is more or less stable. That is, if it has no carbon substituted, it's the least stable. And the more carbons you have substituted around that carbon cation, the more stable it is, or the lower in energy it is. Okay, so carbon cation stability increases from a simple methyl group. Then if you have an ethyl carbon cation here, it's a, it's a primary carbon. This is a secondary carbon, and that's a tertiary, tertiary carbon. Okay? You get lower and lower in energy as you get more and more substitution. That's one of the key things you need to remember about carbocations. The more substituted they are, the more stable they are, the lower in energy they are. And that fits exactly with what we observe in the reactions of alcohols, right? The slowest alcohols to react are ones that are just on uh, CH3 or a primary carbon, okay? The reactions get faster as you substitute more. So if it's a secondary alcohol, it reacts faster and a tertiary alcohol reacts the fastest. So the structure and stability of the carbocation is affecting the rate of the reaction. And what dictates the rate of the reaction? I'm sorry? The slowest step, right? That rate determining step of the process. So that's why it's, we look at each of these individual steps to really see which is the important one for the reaction rate. And then we can make sense as to what we observe. The different alcohol substitutions have different rates of reaction. And it makes sense that the carbocation stability that's being formed in that step must be influencing the transition state energy of that step as well. Okay, so uh, why are carbocations more stable when they're more substituted? Well, it's that the same general concept that the more you can delocalize charge, spread out charge, the more stable and lower energy it is, right? So here's the electrostatic potential maps of a methyl carbocation, an ethyl primary carbocation, secondary carbocation, and a tertiary carbocation. And what do you notice here? Right? If you look at the electron density maps, the electrostatic potential maps, you see a methyl carbocation is, is blue-purple, right? That reflects more positive charge, localized. You put a methyl group on, one methyl group on, you can see that there's still some blue, purple around that carbon, but the molecule overall uh, doesn't have as much blue purple as this one. You put two methyl groups on, you see a little less blue purple, and you put three methyl groups on. While there's still plus charge in the middle, um, a lot of the charge has been spread out, and, and these groups now are more like uh, helping to spread out charge. Okay, and why do they do that? Well, there's something, there, there are two effects. One is the inductive effect, 
And then there's another aspect which we refer to as hyperconjugation. So we know something about inductive effects, right? We know that if you have an electron with uh, electronegative atom, right, it polarizes the bond towards it or away from what it's attached to. But if you if your other group is not electronegative, you have more electron density than a on a carbon than a hydrogen. So if you take a look at this, this is a primary carbocation. Imagine that our p orbital is here, right? This is our plus charge, our empty orbital. Now, because that's plus charge, if something has electrons, it can push those electrons towards it. That helps to stabilize or lower the energy of that. Hydrogens can do that in a tiny bit. Um, but if you have a carbon here now with, with more electron density, electron density than a, a hydrogen, right? It can it can push more electron density towards that through that single signal bond. It's an inductive effect, but it's the carbocation pulling instead of something electronegative pulling away from it. Okay, that does help to stabilize the charge a little bit, spread it out along, so a little bit of the plus charge is spread out over to here. Um, even if it's just a tiny bit, it's better than not being able to do that. So the more carbons you put on there, the more you can donate. So if you put a second carbon here, you can donate and stabilize more. You put a third carbon here, that inductive effect stabilizes it even more. And that's what we see here in this electrostatic potential map. The plus charge on the carbon gets less and less as we put more and more carbons on it. Okay. Now, there is another effect which also leads to stabilization. If you look at this, um, this structure here, again, a p orbital, okay, and that's an empty orbital, uh, what do you see that's aligned with that orbital? Well, notice also there's a CH bond here. And there are two electrons in that sigma bond. Okay? So, although this is not a true, there's no true bonding here, by virtue of being adjacent, what can happen is that electron density can spread and help also alleviate the bond it's aligned with. A better picture of that is right here. Uh -huh. There we go. This shows the. Um, the model of what that looks like, the calculated structures of the valence uh, bond model here and the molecular orbital model here. They are slightly different in shape if you look at the, the two. What we have again is um, this p orbital, empty p orbital, and then we have a sigma bond to the hydrogens with two electrons in it. And you can see that that could be uh, sort of overlapping if it's aligned properly. That's what we refer to as hyperconjugation. Okay, so it's not just pushing electron density through the sigma bond from the carbon to the carbon, but also the electrons in the bonds which are aligned with the p orbital can help to stabilize by sharing. It's not forming a bond, but it's uh, sort of neutralizing the charge electrostatically by having the electrons closer to it, um, and that helps to stabilize it as well. So you can only have that alignment if you have an sp3 carbon next to the p orbital because then you can have the hydrogen in that uh, oriented away uh, in, in the same um, position as the p orbital. So the more you have, so if we put a, another carbon here, you could put another hydrogen on, okay, and that could donate in. And then if you put a third one on, you can have another hydrogen also donating electron density in. So the more alkyl groups you have substituted on the carbon containing the plus charge, the more you have this sharing of the electron density. So this is all additive then? So this is all additive. That's why the more you put on, this more stable it is. Methyl group is least stable. Put one, one carbon on, you get some stability. You put two carbons on, you get more stability. You put three carbons on, you get even more stability. And that's true for um, uh, all of those cases. Okay, that, it's, a, it's a combination of both inductive and hyperconjugation, and they're both going to, towards that same pro idea of stabilizing 
the plus charge. Okay, but bottom line, that's the reasons why it stabilizes the plus charge. The main thing you really need to remember is the more substituted the carbocation is, the more stable it is. Okay? That's the key concept you need to keep in mind. So how does that then affect the reactions? Well, more substituted alcohols react faster. More substituted carbocations are more stable. The rate determining step is the formation of the carbocation. So the stability of the carbocation must have some influence on the stability of on the energy also of the transition state leading to it. So let's look again at this particular um, reaction. We have, uh, this happens to be the tertiary carbocation. We have the propanated alcohol in this step. Now, uh, at the transition state, that bond is coming apart. And then we form the intermediate. And you remember, uh, on Monday we talked about, I, 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 we talked about the Hammond postulate. Anybody remember what the Hammond postulate is? The structure of a transition stage most closely resembles the structure of the nearest energy intermediate. And in this case, uh, we have a reaction step which starts at a low energy and goes to a high energy intermediate. So the transition state structure more resembles this. So if you, if you have an intermediate and you compare different molecules and you have a higher energy intermediate, guess what's going to happen to the energy of the transition state? The transition state energy is also going to be higher. Okay. And if you lower the energy of the, this intermediate, the transition state energy is also going to lower. Because the structure is related. There's, there's some plus charge, or partially plus charge, on that carbon that's, being, that's going to form the carbocation as the bond breaks. Okay. So... Another thing I need to point out, I'll show you all the comparisons in a moment, but another thing I want to point out is in terms of the kinetics of the reaction and what we call this, this is an SN1 reaction, substitution reaction involving a nucleophilic substitution, unimolecular, the rate of the reaction is described by some rate constant and the concentration of only one species, that's this, this, this species. So that's a unimolecular reaction. And that's why we call this a SN1 reaction. Okay, if you, if you look at, I don't know if this is really to scale or not, this chart from your book, but if you look at how the carbocation stability affects the rate of the reaction, you can see that um, for a methyl carbocation, it's going to be the highest energy carbocation of these substituted carbocations, methyl, primary, secondary, and tertiary. And so the transition state to get there is going to be higher also. Just what I was talking about. So to get from the same, you know, from an alcohol to the carbocation intermediate is much, much harder for the methyl or primary than it is for a secondary and then a tertiary. Okay. So when you now start to talk about less general terms and more specific actual examples, the energy of that second step, formation of the carbocation, is altered by the substitution. Because the carbocation that's formed is more stable in the tertiary case. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, and I, again, this is why I'm not sure this is quite to scale, uh, the energy of a methyl or primary carbocation are usually so high that the reaction mechanism actually takes place slightly differently. Because the, it's hard to form those two carbocations, a methyl or a primary carbocation, the reaction, one of the things about chemistry is that if there's a lower energy pathway that's a different pathway that it can find, it's going to take it. So if you're riding your bike over the mountain, right? Go back to the mountain analogy. If you ride your bike over the mountain, 
And instead of going over the top of the mountain, there's a pathway that goes around the side and down. You're going to take the easier one, right? So with a primary or a methyl carbocation, uh, there's another reaction process that could be a little bit faster or a little bit lower energy, still higher than um, a secondary carbocation or a tertiary carbocation, but that involves not breaking the CO bond first. So if we look at this reaction mechanism, it's slightly different. In the, in the first case, we talked about this initial step, which is the same here. Step one is the alcohol being protonated by our hydrogen halide to form this intermediate. That's still the same. It's still a fast equilibrium. And if you looked at that overall energy profile, the energy is rather small to get there, right? Back and forth. So that's still the same. What happens instead in the second step is that instead of the alcohol breaking to form a carbocation, in this case it would be this, right? Instead of breaking to form a carbocation and then forming the bond, to the, in this case the bromide, it all occurs in one step at the same time. That is, the bond breaking of the CO bond and the bond making are happening simultaneously. Okay. Why would it do that? Well, if you think about that bromide being there, right, and instead of forming the carbocation free, having that water completely come off to form an intermediate. Why can't the bromine be donating its electron density at the same time? So you don't have to go to a full-fledged, complete carbon plus intermediate. That might be a lower energy pathway. Uh, and that's exactly what this mechanism describes. This happens to be, by the way, a bimolecular reaction because it involves both the, um, the substrate here and the bromine and the bromide. So both have to be involved in that process. So when you think about the energy profile, that step has to involve both of those things. So it's a bimolecular reaction. And so the reaction rate, here's the rate expression, some, some rate constant times the concentration of the protonated alcohol here and the concentration of the bromide. We refer to this as a second order rate constant, or second order uh, rate. It involves two species. So you notice I've described the mechanism slightly differently. I call it an SN2 reaction mechanism. That stands for what? Substitution. Yeah, substitution nucleophilic bimolecular. It takes two things in that slowest rate determining step. Notice there's not a third step here, because if this is happening at the same time as that bond is breaking, we form directly the product. Okay, so the energy profile for this, this uh, process, um, oh, that's the SN1 energy profile, this pre-equilibrium at the beginning, followed by formation of carbocation, uh, formation of carbocation, Formation of carbocation, and then in the second step, reaction of the halide to form the product. In an SN1 reaction, the difference is that instead of going all the way to here, if your carbocation is primary or methyl, you might be way up there in energy. So instead, it would just do a single step reaction that might be a little lower. That's the difference. Um, and that's why a reaction can proceed by different mechanisms depending on how high energy you would have to go. This is a little bit better picture of that um, step, that particular step. Again, there's a, a pre-equilibrium of your alcohol here, of the protonation. Okay. But looking at this, this, this uh, SN2 step, it's the rate determining step. Okay, it's the highest energy step in the reaction. Uh, but we don't form any intermediate here. It's all happening in one step. 
So this describes a little bit the structure of the transition state. The bromine comes in and the OH, H2O is being kicked off. And halfway at this, um, I would say about halfway through or probably a little bit closer, we have bond forming at the same time bond is breaking. That forms the two products, water and the bromide. Does this make sense? So it's all happening in one step. Notice the structure, okay? In this two-step mechanism, remember we started from a molecule which is sp3 hybridized, and then we formed a carbocation which is sp2 hybridized, and then we formed the product which is sp3 hybridized. In this case, the transition state is involving more than one group on the carbon. Uh, it's actually undergoing an inversion. It's kind of like an end, uh, sorry, uh, an umbrella flipping, inverting. That's kind of what's happening to this carbon as the bromine forms the bond from the back. Let me clean this up. As the bromine forms the bond from the back, the transition state has some bond forming. And notice these groups are shifting this way. Here they are in one plane. And then as this group leaves, they continue moving and end up over here. So this is going to be really important to a little in some of the later chapters, the inversion of that carbon has some aspects on three-dimensional um, aspects of the product, stereoisomers that we're going to talk about later. The rate of the reaction, again, depends on both of those things because at the transition state of the lowest, slowest step, both bromine and this are involved. Um, and that describes very nicely the reaction. So why doesn't this mechanism take place with a tertiary alcohol. Why does the tertiary alcohol form a carbocation? Why would you think that, well, the, car the tertiary carbocation is going to be lower in energy, yes, um, but why wouldn't this also be a lower energy process for a tertiary carbocation? That's right. The, well, t uh, not necessarily too big to move, but too big for the bromine to come in until you've already formed a carbocation. So I've, I've drawn one carbon group here, just generically R. If you think about that as taking up space, right? There's still room for this bromine to get in and form this bond. If this is taking up space and we have a group here, and even a third group here, notice how crowded it's getting behind this carbon. It actually blocks that bromine or slows down the bromine getting in. That actually makes this very crowded and higher energy. So it would rather go through a carbocation. So this is the this is the thing, which is sometimes difficult uh, concept to grasp. You have a reaction of a, a pathway from reactants to products. There could be multiple possibilities, and it's always going to take whatever is the lowest energy possibility. And there are many, many factors involved in this particular reaction we're talking about, substitution of these alcohols. Carbocation stability and now crowdedness will dictate these two pathways. Okay, and they're both they're both important for different reasons. Okay, so that's the SN2 reaction pathway. Again, uh, let's see. I have the next slide. Okay. Um, with the SN2 reaction, I just want to point out, uh, before I talk about this, there are a couple of uh, things to keep in mind. The SN1 goes through a carbocation intermediate, okay, and will work fastest for tertiary substrates and will work for secondary substrates, and will not work for methyl or primary. Okay. Whereas an SN2 reaction will work, goes by one step for that um, substitution step. Uh, one step, meaning bond forms and bond breaks at the same time, uh, is best for methyl or primary. Um, secondary is slower to do that if it has to do that. And Tertiary substrates won't work at all for an SN2. Okay, so they are the, they are dependent on the substitutions for both of these in, for different reasons. 
Okay, um, I have two reactions up here. Two reactions which also convert an OH to a halogen compound. Uh, if you want to make chlorides, there's a way to do this um, using not HCl, but thionyl chloride, SOCl2. That's thionyl chloride. Okay, so instead of HCl, we have a different kind of electrophile, thionyl chloride. The structure of thionyl chloride uh, looks like this. Uh, yes, looks like that. So what do you think the nature of the thionyl chloride reagent is? Electrophilic or nucleophilic? It's going to be electron deficient. Um, another way, if you want to make bromides, is to use, by the way, these reactions are not balanced, you'll notice. If you want to make bromides, you can use phosphorus tribromide. Phosphorus tribromide um, is also an electrophilic reagent. The phosphorus uh, can form more bonds because it uh, has d orbitals available, empty d orbitals available. Um, phosphorus tribromide uh, directly. Both of these reactions um, involve a step which is an SN2 substitution step. That is, we have a halide bond forming at the same time a CO bond is breaking. Um, in order to understand how this works, though, uh, recall before when we had an alcohol bond, uh, COH, right? And to form the carbocation or to form or to do this, okay, SN2 process. What's important for having that happen? It's not going to occur directly from the alcohol. It's going to occur from the protonated form. Okay, so only then, only once you have, um, you know, some way to reduce electron density here, do you weaken this bond from the C to the O and allow either formation of carbocation or direct substitution with the halide to occur. Those reagents are very special because not only do they provide the halogen in the form of Cl minus or Br minus, but the reagents also allow a way to activate the carbon oxygen bond. Okay? Uh, and what happens here, for example, how much time do we have? Just a couple minutes. I'll just show one example. We'll come back to this on Friday. An oxygen, remember, has an acidic hydrogen and lone pairs, and it's the lone pair which reacts with HBr to take the proton, right? Well, it can also react with this. So this is partially positive. This is partially negative. It can actually react with the thionyl chloride uh, in, in a way like this. So think about the sulfur as being like a big proton. It's something plus, which is reacting with the oxygen lone pair. Okay? That negative charge, while being withdrawn by the oxygen, that could come back down and kick off the chloride. So the intermediate... initially formed looks like that. Notice the similarity between that now and a protonated alcohol. We have an R-O-H-S-O-C-L group. Um, we now have weakened the carbon oxygen bond and now reactions can take place. We'll talk more details about this in the phosphorus tribromide example on Friday.